December 21st, 1968. The shortest day of the year. But in significance, perhaps one of the longest in the flow of history. This is Apollo Saturn launch control. We are still go at this time. T minus 15, 14, 13, 12, 11, 10, 9. We have ignition sequence start. The engines are on. 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. We have commit. We have we have liftoff. Liftoff at 7.51 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. We have cleared the top. Tower clear, 13 seconds. The United States was undertaking the most distant voyage ever attempted by man. For the first time, three Americans rode the Saturn V moon rocket. Jim Lovell and Bill Anders were about to leave their cradle earth and face the infinite frontier. Apollo 8, Houston. Go ahead, Houston. Apollo 8, you are go for TLI. Over. I understand. We're go for TLI. TLI, translunar insertion. This was the commitment. Borman, Lovell, and Anders were ready for the maneuver that would send them to the moon. As the world listened and watched, its people were overtaken by a new awareness, an awareness that they were perhaps witnessing the overture to the ultimate destiny of man. Ignition. Lovell confirms ignition. And the thrust is okay, Booster says. On board the spacecraft, and in mission control, the men of Apollo 8 watched the readouts. Velocity build up in feet per second. The numbers snowballing toward the velocity that would allow the spacecraft to escape Earth's gravity. Okay, we got and Borman says we've got Seco. Cutoff was right on the second. With the cutoff of their third stage engine, Apollo 8 was traveling faster than had any men before a coasting uphill climb against the pull of their native planet. Now the third stage, the S-4B, was just useless mass to them. It was jettisoned, then later placed into an orbit around the sun. The crew of Apollo 8 turned around for a look. I used an Apollo 8, how do you read? Yeah, loud and clear, Frank, how are you? Roger, we're uh, loud and clear. We're taking pictures of the S-4B. Uh, the uh, post-separation sequence is is uh, completed and we seem to have a high gain. Give us clues to what it looks like from way up there. Roger. I can see the entire Earth now out of the center window. I can see Florida, Cuba, Central America, the whole northern half of Central America, in fact, all the way down through Argentina and down through uh, Chile. They so picked a good day for it. for information. I'm looking through the scanning telescope now and I see millions of stars, most of them uh, the bending from the S-4B. The crew of Apollo 8 now settled down to the routine of the outward flight. Systems checks, observations, navigational star sightings. Uh, Jim, uh, they've just been uh, looking at your, your marks with respect to uh, accuracy and they figure they're within a uh, couple thousandths of a degree of the uh, theoretical optimum. 
Lovell's proficiency in navigating the spacecraft with its onboard optical instruments would eventually earn him the nickname, the man with the golden fingers. His speed was such that he would be requested to slow down so that the earthbound machines recording the data could keep up with him. The accuracy of his sightings was virtually flawless, symbolic of the entire mission, a mission so accurate that several of the planned mid-course corrections would be dropped as unnecessary. Astronauts, spacecraft, flight controllers, computers. The precision was fantastic. Then on the second day out, the world looked in on the crew via television. This transmission is coming to you approximately halfway between the moon and the earth. We've been uh, 31 hours, about 20 minutes into flight. We have about uh, less than 40 hours left to go to the moon. So Apollo 8 glided on silently, farther from Earth than man had ever before been, a microscopic dot of life in the cosmic void. Around the world, in Goldstone, California, Madrid, Spain, Canberra, Australia, the gigantic antennas of the deep space network tracked Apollo 8, received its communiques, picked up the voice of its telemetry. Only for the 40 minutes of its transit behind the moon on each orbit would Apollo 8 lose contact with Earth. Then, on the day before Christmas, the network zeroed in on the spacecraft television antenna for the second broadcast to Earth. All right, you're all looking at yourselves as seen from 180,000 miles out in space. Mike, what I uh, keep imagining is if I'm a, some lonely traveler from another planet, what I think about the Earth from this altitude whether I think it'd be inhabited or not. You don't see anybody waiting, is that what you're saying? Well, I'm just kind of curious uh, whether I would land on the blue or the brown part of the Earth. You better hope we land in the blue part. Shortly after they turned off the television camera, Borman, Lovell, and Anders ended their long climb away from Earth. Crossing the point where the gravity of Earth and Moon just balanced, they became the first men to fall toward another celestial body. Now the time approached for the most immense commitment of the mission, Lunar Orbit Insertion, LOI. A burn of the service module engine would place Apollo 8 into orbit around the moon. Up to this time, without further major maneuvers, the spacecraft would loop around the moon and return to Earth. Once the burn was made, Apollo 8 would be held by the moon's gravity field until a later burn would push it free. Apollo 8, this is Houston at 6804, your goal for LOI. Okay, Apollo 8 is go. Uh, you're riding the best bird we can find. Lunar orbit insertion would take place on the backside of the moon. With the moon between the spacecraft and the Earth, all contact would be lost until it appeared on the other side. In mission control, they anticipated LOS, loss of signal from Apollo 8. Now, Mission Control and the world could only wait. Wait for the first contact with Apollo 8 as it emerged from behind the moon. We've got it. Uh, we've got it. Apollo uh, 8 now in, in lunar orbit. Uh, there's a chair in the, this room. Uh, this is Apollo Control Houston, uh, switching now to the voice of Jim Lovell. By 60.5. Good to hear your voice. The burn was as close to perfect as possible. Later burns would circularize the orbit, and the three astronauts would circle the moon ten times in 20 hours. Sunrise, sunset, every two hours on an alien world. And they would take pictures, still photographs as well as motion picture film, here seen at a much faster rate than orbital velocity. Uh, Apollo 8, Houston, uh, what does the old moon look like from 60 miles, over? Okay, uh, Houston, the moon is essentially gray, no color, looks like plaster of Paris, okay, or uh, sort of a grayish beach sand. We can see quite a bit of detail. Uh, the equator craters are all rounded off, there's quite a few of them, some of our newer. Many of them look like, uh, especially the round ones, look like uh, hit by meteorites or projectiles of some sort. Well, Ingridus is quite a huge crater. It's got a central cone to it. The walls of the crater are, are terraced, 
uh, about uh, six or seven different terraces on the way down. The world saw and heard the first live telecast of the lunar surface. Hey, Bill, how would you describe the color of the moon from here? Uh, the color of the moon looks uh, a very whitish gray, like uh, dirty beach sand, and uh, with lots of footprints in it. Don't these two craters look like uh, pickaxes striking uh, concrete, leaving a lot of fine haze dust? Scientist, engineer, astronaut, the world, all followed the progress of Apollo 8. For this was preparation, an advanced scout marking the way for those who would follow, those who would orbit, those who would land, navigate, track, observe, record, describe. There's no trouble picking out uh, features that we learned on the map. Certainly looks like uh, we're picking the more interesting parts of the moon to land in. The backside uh, looks like a sand pile. My kids have been playing in for a long time. It's all beat up, no definition. Just a lot of bumps and holes. The area that we're over right now uh, uh, gives us a hint of uh, possible volcanic. So I really can't uh, eyeball it at the moment to uh, pin that down. No, there are some. Uh, then a Christmas Eve message the world could not forget. Welcome from the moon, Houston. Thank you. The moon is a uh, different thing to each one of us. I know my own impression is that it's a, a vast, lonely, forbidding type existence or expanse of nothing. It looks rather like clouds and clouds of pumice stone. Beyond technology, beyond science, Apollo 8 was bringing to the world a new awareness, an expansion of mind and spirit that must forever alter the perspective of humanity, physically and philosophically. And from the crew of Apollo 8, we close with good night, good luck, a Merry Christmas, and God bless all of you, all of you on the good earth. There was little time for the crew of Apollo 8 to reflect. The next job was to make sure that the spacecraft was ready for the most critical maneuver of the mission, the firing of the service module engine for TEI, trans-Earth insertion, and the trip home. There was no go, no-go decision on this one. It had to go. All systems are go, Apollo 8. Thank you. For the final time, Apollo 8 passed behind the moon out of contact with Earth for this most critical of all the burns. On the ground, men waited. Apollo 8, Houston. Apollo 8, Houston. Apollo 8, Houston. Apollo 8, Houston. Apollo 8, over. Hello, Apollo 8. Loud and clear. Roger. Please be informed there is a Santa Claus. That's affirmative. You're the best one to know. Three very tired astronauts were on their way home. And with them rode an army of engineers, scientists, technicians, programmers, flight controllers, all those whose dedicated efforts were Apollo 8. After catching up on their rest, homeward bound, there was more a mood of elation contrasted with the outbound loneliness. I told Michael, you guys are up there, and uh, he said, who's driving? That's a good question. I think Isaac Duke is doing most of the driving right now. We were enjoying the holiday in the Christian world, Christmas, and we paused for a moment in our celebrations to watch three travelers heading home. As many of us sat down to our Christmas meal, Borman, Lovell, and Anders were enjoying theirs. It appears that we did a grave injustice to the food people. Santa Claus brought us some, a TV dinner each, which is delicious. Turkey and gravy, cranberry sauce, grape punch, outstanding. Hi, 
Thank you, Jim. Glad to hear it. You know, we're down here eating cold coffee and bologna sandwiches. As on the way out, there were periods of work. The navigational ability of the spacecraft and crew was proving phenomenal. And periods of rest, a single man on watch. Well, Ken, that just leaves you or I. How about uh, you and I? Anything exciting happen today? We're real quiet down here. Uh, everybody's smiling. Everything's pretty, pretty calm, like it should be on Christmas. Very good. Yeah, Mel says we're in a period of relaxed vigilance. Very good. We'll relax, you be vigilant. The final television transmission, 97,000 miles out, farther than man had been on any previous mission, but now tantalizingly close to home. I uh, think I must have the feeling that the travelers in the old sailing ships used to have. We're going on a very long voyage away from home, and uh, now we're headed back, and uh, I have that feeling of being proud of the trip, but still, uh, still happy to be going back home and back to our home port. Every second brought the spacecraft closer to its fiery entry, the final plunge to the safety of Earth. On the morning of December 27th, the word was given to Apollo 8. The pyrotechnic devices that would separate the command and service modules prior to entry were armed. Apollo 8, Apollo 8. Your go for pyro arm. Everything's looking good. Roger, everything's looking good here, Ken. On schedule, the command module jettisoned the service module to expose the main heat shield. Aligned itself to entry attitude and slammed into the atmosphere at 25,000 miles per hour, faster than man had ever traveled until Apollo 8. A tracking aircraft took these films of the entry, the spacecraft seen as an incandescent fireball. With the temperature on the heat shield reaching 5,000 degrees, the communications were blacked out. The men in mission control waited once more. Ken Mattingly just put in a call and just frankly labeled it a radio check. He's gotten no responses yet. Ken Mattingly puts in a, another call. And <laughs> there's Jim Lovell. We're in real good shape here, Jim. Real fine. The landing was right on target. Later, Frank Borman would report passing over the recovery ship as Apollo 8 drifted down toward the sea on its parachutes. As Borman, Lovell, and Anders stepped onto the carrier deck, a huge and patriotic celebration broke loose in mission control. A celebration echoed by the hundreds of thousands of men and women who were Apollo 8. Again, it's Apollo control here. I'm not sure how well our voice is getting out. Uh, there is a tremendous roar, an undercurrent of roar in the background. And I have never seen uh, the degree of this emotional outpouring in any previous mission, including Alan Shepard's. I've seen uh, rallies in locker rooms after championship games. I've seen happy politicians after elections, but I, and none of them do justice to the spirit pervading this room. But the triumph of Apollo 8 was beyond the bounds of nationalism. It was a fruition of the ages of humanity. The first Chinese setting off a gunpowder rocket. The Englishman, Newton. The German, Kepler. The Russian, Tsiolkovsky. The American, Goddard. For one moment in history, the nations of Earth were united in the eternity of deep space. In Havana, in Washington, 
in London, in Moscow, in Tokyo. All of mankind joined three Americans orbiting 60 miles above a stark, lifeless world. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, Let there be light. And there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good. And God divided the light from the darkness. The vast loneliness up here on the moon is uh, awe-inspiring, and it makes you realize just what you have back there on Earth. The Earth from here is a grand oasis of the big vastness of space. Give us, O oh God, the vision which can see thy love in the world in spite of human failure. Give us the faith to trust the goodness in spite of our ignorance and weakness. Give us the knowledge that we may continue to pray with understanding hearts. And show us what each one of us can do to set forward the coming of the day of universal peace. Amen.